Hey how you doing? Hope you all are doing great. As you seen in the thumbnail, in this video, we are gonna see, what if Naruto banished and becomes rich, Kanoha bashing. This is part 1, and before getting into video. I request you to check the author of this fanfic, and show some love and support. Name of the story is. My word is Labai. Lord Farsight, do check it out. All details in description. And if you want next part of this series. Please leave a like share, and consider subscribe. And I have uploaded part 2 of Naruto Mary's Fire Daimo Daughter on Patreon for free, because it has lemon, and guideline won't allow it. So you can listen on Patreon for free, so do check out dot link in description. Let's get into the video. Kanoha was the oldest of the hidden villages, the eldest of this very violent family, but certainly not the wiser. Nearly 13 years after the Kayubi attacked the village, a defection had occurred, the betrayal of the last Ichiha in the village, Sasuke due to the recent Sand Sound invasion, the village was forced to put the weight of an enormous amount of missions on a thin force. Ninjas that were used to have time and lounge a bit in their free time, were suddenly forced to work day and night, to ensure the village still appeared strong to the other powers. This sudden drop of the ninja presence in the village, left plenty of occasions for the deserters, and Sasuke Ichiha took one such occasion. Because of this lack of experienced ninja, the Hokage was forced to send a squad of genin after the traitor and his unknown escort. It was an utter miracle that the Sound Four were defeated and an even bigger miracle when it appeared that, despite heavy injuries and two near-death cases, there were no death. However, that was where the miracles stopped. Despite Uzumaki Naruto's best efforts, he failed, and Sasuke Ichiwa left. Sasuke was viewed by the Leaf civilians as their little prince, and such an event did not sit well with them. In their rage, they did what they had done for the last 13 years. They blamed the innocent. The civilians became enraged, shouting it was Naruto's fault that he caused Sasuke's desertion, not realizing in their narrow minds that he was the one that could have avoided it. In their fury, they began demanding the banishment of the blonde, and when it was refused, an insurrection erupted. A good 90% of the civilian population of the village went against the Hokage. Drawn by the smell of blood, some ninja clans and shinobi of various renown came to support the motion putting Tsunade in front of a full-scale revolt. At first, she began to repress the insurrection, but defections inside the Anbu forced her to bow to avoid the civil war. She was the one to tell Naruto of this, to tell him that, in order to save his life, she had to crush his dream. Tsunade was the first to admit that it was a bitter defeat, and Naruto had completely collapsed when he heard that. It was grief-stricken that Naruto had been released from the hospital. Jiraiya soon came to him with an offer. He would take him as an apprentice, make him stronger than any ninja in Kanoha, so powerful that they would be forced to beg him to come back and make him Hokage. Of course, Naruto knew it was his only sliver of hope, so he went for it without any second thoughts. However, the village wasn't finished. A particularly vicious jonin with some skills in Fuinjutsu decided that banishment was not enough, so he captured Naruto, tortured him for hours, and then crushed his last hope by sealing off all of his chakra permanently. A seal had been engraved in his blood using a forbidden and particularly painful ritual, and even a seal master as experienced as Jiraiya could do nothing about it. Kakashi, which was in the village in between mission, was the first to find Naruto after he savagely murdered his tormentor. The blood-covered blonde was crying in a corner of the basement of the jonin, crying over the dream that had been taken away from him once again. Jiraiya and Tsunade did not know what to do anymore. Naruto was going to be banished, and now he didn't even have the means to defend himself. Two days before the banishment, while they were desperately trying to find a solution, Naruto beat them to the punch, deciding to leave the village on his own and disappear. The shattered blonde was walking through the village, walking slowly to the gates, so focused that he became oblivious to the taunts and insults sent his way. As he walked through the market, the villagers did one last mistake. A villager, out of spite, threw a knife at him. Without even looking, Naruto blocked it in between his fingers. The other villagers, irritated, began insulting him louder and louder, until one of them snapped and tried to stab the blonde with a knife. Inside the teen, something broke, and so began what would be later remembered as the marketplace slaughter. When the Anbu arrived, they were shocked. The market was bloodied, bodies littered the floors, the wounded and the dying were crying in pain, and Naruto was calmly walking down the street, a bloody knife in each hand. The shock was so great that none stopped the blonde from leaving. As Naruto disappeared behind the horizon, the village realized what happened, how a seemingly harmless child had slaughtered over 50 people, how he could have done so for years, how he just went with pranks. They realized that they went too far, and maybe created the very demon they accused him of being for so long. Fear began to spread. In this context of shock and sorrow, the Hyuga elders acted. Taking advantage of one of Hiyashi's training trips with Hanabi, they branded Hanada with the cage bird seal, before forcing her through a painful and humiliating ritual, resulting in a seal that would kill her if she ever became pregnant. 
Once their deed was done, they took advantage of Tsunade's sorrow to make her sign the banishment of the young girl. In less than a day, the already emotionally battered Hinata had lost her title of heiress, her status as a leaf ninja and her home. She set off to the wild, stumbling on shaking legs, vaguely hoping to meet her crush along the way, but knowing deep down that she would not. When Tsunade realized what she had signed, she frantically tried to erase the act, but it was too late. When he Ashi came back with his youngest, he was met with the news. His first reaction was to ask coldly if it was a joke of any kind, but the Hokage's red eyes told him otherwise. Slowly, realization and horror dawned on his usually impassive face. Anabi, shocked, asked her father what would happen of his sister, but he Ashi did not answer with words, but with tears. Two days later, the elders were executed in front of the whole clan by Hiashi himself. He then quickly sent as many search teams as possible to find his daughter and bring her back, hoping that Jiraiya could get rid of, at least, the degrading seal that prevented her from giving birth, but it was quickly revealed that the girl had, for all intent, disappeared. Roughly at the same time, Intaki, a 13-years-old girl with pale green hair was driven out of the village by a mob of villagers, civilians and ninja alike. Her one crime was to be the container of the Shichibi, and because of that she was hunted down. It was, sadly, quite a common occurrence in her life. They would first attack her small house, breaking the windows and furniture, damaging the walls and such, then they would hunt her to the outskirts of the village, where she would wait a few days then go back. The leader of the village, her uncle, never really paid attention to any of this because she always came back, but not this time. Her house had been burnt down, she had lost everything, and her own blood father had turned his back on her, she had no more reasons to stay. With one last hateful look at Taki, she left, to the west, and its unknown and savage lands. The night had fallen on the palace, engulfing the throne room in dreadful shadows. A man stood there with eight guards around him, frightened. He was not afraid of the guards, but of the shadowy figure seating on the throne, only their feet visible. Why why you can't do that? You can't. I'll have you killed if you even dare to think of that threatened the man, but it was for naught, his voice too laced with fear. The person on the throne made a motion of their tiny, delicate hand, and three corpses fell from the ceiling. The man was now visibly shaking. No. I I'll give you wealth. I can give you anything. Even you must need things I sell. I I. The sound of snapping fingers was his only answer as a guard drew his sword. I I don't want to die for the first and last time, the man heard the voice belonging to the occupant of the throne, strangely calm and gentle, but laced with overwhelming authority. I am an empress. My word is law. A sword cut through the night, and silence fell on the palace again. Naruto was sitting, looking at the ocean, like he so often did during the last six years, his memories passing before his eyes. After his painful banishment and last act of violence, he went to wave and settle there. Of course, the country had been enraged with the way Konoha had treated him, and reacted accordingly by shutting all trade agreements with Konoha, and severely reducing their trade with Fire Country. The entire country stood by his side, never moving, not even when he revealed everything about the Kayubi. The argument had been closed when Tezuna bellowed that demons don't help people. With Wave's newfound freedom came a little bit more of comfort. During one of his afternoons at the port, helping the fishers, Naruto asked one of them why they didn't trade it with countries other than fire country, since they were ideally placed to reach tea, lightning and water country. This led to a council from the mayors of the country, and then the creation of a trade port to test the idea. Within the first month, the port had been flooded and money had flown into the country, as it evolved into a trade platform of great importance. With the money came luxuries the country could not afford before, like a large library. Naruto had spent all of his free time in the library, doing something he never did in the leaf. Learning. During his years, he had accumulated an impressive sum of knowledge. People began to come to seek advice three years after he left Konoha, and he had seen quite a lot of people. Envoys from several curious daimyo, traders and even his former teammate Sasuke. The blonde smiled amusedly thinking of their two meetings. The first was soon after he killed the snake that trained him, and the Avenger didn't ask for any advice, and the second had been soon after he learned the truth on his brother, and this time he did seek advices. The true leader of the Akastuki went to him, to capture him he said, and cynically offered him the occasion to advise him. He had exposed his plan, expecting the usual moral arguments. But Naruto had moved past a point where his arguments were fully moral. He had calmly explained why his plan was useless, how it would only delay the wars, how it would bring unnecessary and useless pain to the world, how his inheritors would fight over the power left behind. The masked man grew more and more fierce, trying to defend his idea, only to see it methodically shot down. In the end, he left, defeated and disillusioned, his only determination left being to tell Sasuke the truth and die by his hand. Before he left, he gave Naruto a present that he didn't await it anymore. The name of his parents. 
the information left him moping around for some time, but in the end he got over it and went on with his life. Soon after, Sasuke came to see him again. He was lost, he didn't know who to hate or what to do anymore. He told his former friend everything, how his clan betrayed Konoha and how Itachi killed them to save the village. Naruto's answer was to find Itachi, talk to him, and maybe find a way to bring him back to Konoha while clearing his name, but he warned Sasuke that it would be at the cost of his clan's honor. Three months later, Sasuke had surrendered to Konoha and revealed everything of the Ichiha revolt, Itachi had been called back, decorated for his service going beyond what could be normally asked, and due to the population pressure, Sasuke had only been condemned to two years of jail. Soon after he had surrendered, Tsunade and Jiraiya came to see Naruto with those of the rookies that did not thought ill of him and were free. After the Kyubi issue had been made public knowledge, they were a handful. Shino didn't speak much, but what he said was meaningful, Lee had been as exuberant as he remembered him to be, Niji had been warmer than anyone would have thought, and, surprisingly, Shikamaru had been quite excited to see him again. Among those that weren't there, Choji didn't exactly knew what to think of him, Sakura was too ashamed to see him, Tenten didn't really knew him, Ino was completely freaked out by the Kayubi, as for Kiba, he was putting the responsibility for Hinata's banishment on the blonde shoulders. Thinking of the Hayuga heiress, Naruto felt his old heartache come back. Even in Wave, he had heard of the banishment of the Hayuga heiress and had quickly set off to find her. Three months of intense research had led to nothing, and when he came back, he was crying softly. Only then had he learned she had been banished for standing up for him. It was still something he would cry over. Feeling a presence behind him, Naruto looked above his shoulder curiously before smiling warmly at the Iwan Inn. Namakiz-sama, Tsuchikage-sama and Raikage-sama are waiting for you. Okman Ryu-san, I already told you, no need to go with the Sama Thinji, I'm just an hermit. Yet you already avoided a major conflict and two minor wars. Ah, air, yeah, that. Oh, well. Let's go, A-san is not the most patient guy ever, and it's worse when B's around. Getting up, Naruto dusted his beige coat. Underneath it, he wore a dark blue kimono and black sandals. His hair had grown wilder with the years, showing more his lineage. The two men began walking toward the town hall, where the two Kage were waiting for Naruto. It had been quite a surprise to the blonde when the Raikage had sent an envoy asking for his mediation during a political conflict with the Tsuchikage, and even more of a surprise when Anoki had accepted while it was evident his father was the Yellow Flash. In the end, everything worked out fine and a bloody conflict was avoided. Following this, several small villages asked him the same, and Naruto managed to avoid some more wars. Right now, Naruto had been asked to be the witness of the peace treaty between Kumo and Iwa, an achievement he was very proud of. As he came inside the building, he had the pleasing surprise to see that A and Anoki were talking together, mostly complaining about paperwork, while in a corner, Kuritsuchi was shamelessly messing with Akumo Jonin. Seeing the blonde was there, the two leaders stopped talking and smiled contentedly at him. Ah, so you finally decided to join us. Tired of watching the sea? Eh, never. But if I left you two unattended, you would probably come up with some evil plan to get rid of the world's paperwork. And how is that evil? Uh no, but I'm sure you could make it evil. The burst into laughter, slamming a hand on Naruto's back, who didn't even flinched. All right Namakas, ready to sign your first peace treaty. You make it sound like there will be more. Ha, hey, you managed to erase the tensions between Kumo and Iwa, young man. With that mind of yours, I'm willing to bet you could even bring peace between my village and Konoha. It would be ironically fitting considering who your father was. Yeah. Well maybe another day, for now we have a treaty to sign. With a nod, the two Kage took their place and signed the treaty, it was then Naruto's turn to do so. With this treaty, a new era was beginning, and maybe peace would come forth. After such a short act, they all felt a sense of accomplishment completely disproportionate, but they didn't care. An overly enthusiastic A asked the mayor, Tazuna, if they could stay here to celebrate a bit, which was of course accepted without any complaint. Naruto and the others then left the building, only to be welcomed by a surprising, and for the two leaders, angering view. Two peoples, a man and a woman, wearing the cloak of the Akatsuki. Immediately, the two leaders were ready to fight, but Naruto stopped them. No. There will be no fighting. What? Are you kidding? They're here for you. He is right young one, they will kill you. I don't fear death. You can all calm down, we are not here to fight. Uneasily said the woman. The Iwa and Kumonin relax ever so slightly and studied the two Akatsuki before them. The man was a redeated middle-aged man, and the woman had blue hair with a piercing in the lower lip. Naruto faced them with a smile. Well, if you are not here to fight, then maybe you would like to ask for an advice. How? Excuse me sir. I quite didn't catch that since you were whispering. Naruto asked sheepishly. How? How can you, with just words, swat away decades of hatred? 
how is such a thing possible? At first, everyone was silent, but a sad smile appeared on Naruto's face. Then you must be Nagato and Conan. Jiraiya-sensei told me about you too. I take it Yuhiko perished. It is sad. Sai such a question cannot be answered quickly, come, we will be more at ease to talk around a cup of tea. But I must ask one last thing. Turning to the two leaders with hope in his eyes, the blonde asked the question he ever asked when either of them came nearby. Do you have any news of her? Anoki only lowered his head with a sigh, while Lei shook his head solemnly. I see. Once again, thank you for your continuous efforts. Bidding his farewell, Naruto led the leaders of AIM to his house, a small house that reflected the way of life he chose to adopt. Sitting them at the table, he quickly prepared some tea before beginning to answer their question. When they left the next morning, Nagato was humbled in many ways. While the Akastuki leaders were crossing the bridge, Naruto saw a familiar silhouette coming toward him. Sending a surprised glance at the two aimed in and returning an uneasy greeting, the black-haired Kanoha Jonin continued on his way. Sasuke had changed a lot, and that was seen in both his attitude and clothing. He was now wearing proudly his Kanoha flak jacket, a black Hayori bearing the Ichiha crest on his back above it and a sword strapped to his back. As he reached Naruto, he greeted him with a warm yet hesitant smile. Naruto. Sasuke I think I know why you're here. You want me to go back to Kanoha. Yes. It's your home after all, you belong there. No, I don't. This village has insulted me, ridiculed me, tortured me and broken my one dream twice. And now that my father's name is known, they want me to go back. No. Besides, here I can make the difference, I can bring peace. Are you sure? Hell yeah. Just yesterday I signed a peace treaty between Iwa and Kumo. Isn't that awesome? Asked Naruto with one of his biggest grins. So it will forever be beyond me how you can swing from dead serious to overly happy in just a second. But that was not what I meant. I know. But I will stand by my decision. My friends know where to find me and they can come whenever they want. Even Kiba came by. It was to break my face, but, oh well. I always healed fast. Is there any way to make you change your mind? Tell me Hinata-chan is back in Kanoha and I just might think about it. Said Naruto, looking away. That's not funny. That's not a joke. Seeing his friend's seriousness, Sasuke's head dropped. Naruto nobody heard of her in six years and she wasn't that strong I know it's hard to accept, but she's probably dead. I know. And you will let that hold you back. That's not the Naruto I know. That Naruto died six years ago. Do you really think you could know the new one with barely three meetings? One thing is for sure. You changed. Yeah. Oh, but where are my manners? You never had any. Well that changed too. Come on, let's go to my house. Naruto then led the Ichiha to his house, light talking keeping their minds distracted along the way. Far from there, to the west, in the capital of a young empire, a blue-haired beauty awoke to the peaceful face of her mint-haired lover. Like her, she was from the east and had been thrown out of one of the hidden villages. They formed one of the most unlikely couples. The strong-willed container and the once me Karis. But Hinata was far past that point. Her banishment had made her bitter, her inability to bear life making her even angrier. She had met Fu on the way to the west, and they became friends due to shared pains, and the fact Hinata didn't care about Fu's biju. They grew closer in the west, and quickly an objective came to their minds. Unify the lands to help its people. For four years they had battled the warlords that ruled these lands and had won many victories, until finally an empire was born. Fu was the first general, and an exceptional one at that, she knew how to motivate the troops, while still being able to negotiate a treaty on the fly. Hinata, on the other hand, was the real leader. She was the initiator of the unification war, and many battles had been avoided when her voice rang. She was told to be able to bend even the most stubborn to her will with words alone, and she had an incredible talent to manage complex tasks. During the war, Fu and Hinata had grown even closer, until they became lovers. It was after an awfully bloody battle, Fu was depressed, and Hinata had tried to comfort her. After Fu's cries died down, they had stayed looking at each other's eyes for several minutes before kissing softly. Since then, they stood at each other's side, supporting their lover with unshakable faith. The young empire prospered under Hinata's rule, and peace was reigning over the land. Now, it was time to look to the east once more, to look for her old crush, and maybe see if he could be more. Few knew that Hinata's feelings were still strong for the blonde, Hinata had confessed it herself, but she didn't mind, as long as Hinata still loved her she was willing to share, with the added condition of being allowed to have her way with the blonde. Soon Naruto-kun, soon. With a smile, Hinata concentrated once again on her beloved few. As always, they had slipped under the silk of the sheets naked, enjoying the touch of the soft material against their skin. Besides, it allowed for some morning fun. Like right now. 
With a mischievous smile, Hinata began to fondle one of Fu's breast, while her other hand went to grope the girl's backside, earning a soft moan as an answer. As Hinata continued to caress her lover, she began to kiss the tanned skin of her beloved, beginning with the neck before slowly going down until she reached the Jinchuriki's chest. There, she stopped for some time, kissing lovingly the right mound while caressing the left. Meanwhile, her left hand was slowly making its way to Fu's womanhood, feeling and hearing her rousal along the way. To Hinata's ears, her lover's moans and pants were music. Finally coming out of her dreams and into the blissful reality, Fu began to stir, moaning a bit more loudly, as her hands traveled to Hinata's head, caressing her hair lovingly. Um, you sure know how to wake me up love. Oh, you're awake. But I'm not done. Purred Hinata. Let's pretend I'm still sleeping, okay. Hmm. With a soft giggle, Hinata went back to caressing the girl's body, leaving the chest to slowly go further down, her head slowly disappearing under the sheets, as her left hand came back to please the abandoned breast. After a few moments, Fu took a sharp intake of air, moaning now more loudly than before, spasms of pleasure coursing through her body, as her chest began to rise faster and more erratically, and her hips began to buck on their own accord, while her back was arching. Hinata slowly and lovingly led Fu to the brinks of her release, keeping her there for a long time, making the usually unbreakable general putty in her hands. After what seemed like hours of the sweet torture, Hinata finally allowed Fu to reach her peak, making the mint-haired woman moan loudly in pleasure. Coming out from under the sheets, Hinata slowly kissed her way up Fu's body, stopping at her lips as their bodies melted against each other, their chests pressed together, and their hands roaming the back of their lover. Finally pulling out of the kiss, a very flushed and panting Fu looked at Hinata. Maybe we should take it to the shower you know to avoid ruining the sheets. But the smile, Hinata kissed her lover and, still kissing her, led her to the shower. After they were done with playing around in the hot water, the imperial couple left the comfort of their apartments and walked to Hinata's office. The empress was clothed in a simple dark blue yukata embroidered with a golden dragon and low-heeled sandals, while her consort was wearing black cargo pants, a dark green armor on her chest above a black shirt, a dark orange haori with golden rings on her shoulders and in the middle of her back, dark green forearm protections to go with her armor and reinforced low-heeled sandals. As she grew, Hinata had let her hair grow, and they were now flowing past her waist, two shoulder-long strands framing her face, Fu on the other hand, had mostly retained her childhood hairstyle, only letting a long strand of hair grow to mid-back length and decorating it with golden pearls. Once in the office, they began working on their paperwork, Hinata dealing with it the fastest. Due to years of dealing with such pain, she knew exactly where to look to quickly know what was involved. Even if she trained Fu, the mint-haired war master was more at ease on a battlefield or a training ground than facing paper enemies. Luckily there were few papers to work on this day, and they quickly finished their work. Okay Hina-chan, the Kazikage should be here soon. Heh, I wish you were there when I talked to his envoy. The guy was ultra laid back, and damn weird with that, can you believe he was wearing makeup? Makeup? Was he using puppets? Oh no, I didn't fight him, but he did have scrolls on his back. He was also wearing some kind of cat cosplay. Pankuro of the Hidden Sand, nicknamed the Lord of Puppets. He fraught Sasori of the Red Sands head on and even stole half of his puppets and all of his most powerful ones. Huh? So he's a badass. Well he still went pale when he learned who I am. Looks like the War Lady is known to the East too. So it seems. I didn't pay much attention to the politics in the Suna, I wonder who is the Kazikage. I heard it's a guy with huge bags under his eyes and that he used to be a psycho. Arasan. You know him. He is the container of the Achibi. Maybe he knows where Naruto-kun is. I sure hope so, I wanna meet that guy. Anada smiled at Fu's brash announcement. As she was about to answer, a knock was heard at the door. Fu opened it to see a servant. The man elegantly bowed and informed them that the Suna envoy had arrived. Thanking him, the two women rose to their feet, Hinata grabbing her veil on the way. She never appeared before strangers with her face unobscured, it was both a way of protection and intimidation. Her eyes were a source of superstition and one of the reasons of her charisma. She was believed to be blind yet able to see into the soul of those before her. Putting on her dark blue veil, she entered the throne room and sat on the throne. The room was gigantic, a dozen of five feet large painted columns were lining the long dark gold carpet leading to the throne, with smaller ones behind them, each pillar engraved in honor of one of the summoned clans that supported the rise of the empire. The crane, lion, panther, fox, tanuki, wolf and raven clans were among the most notable. Samurai wearing the dark yellow armor of the empire stood guard in the halls, and shinobi of the innumerable clans of the empire were hiding in the ceiling. At the end of the enormous hall stood the throne, a golden chair with dragon decorations. The wall behind the throne was decorated with wooden statues of dragons, their slender silhouettes snaking on the wall. 
The five dragons presented were the most powerful of the dragon clan, the personal summons of the empress. How she came to impress such beasts, no one knew, but it was a mark of her might and wisdom everyone bowed to. As she sat on the throne, Hinata Hyuga ceased to be, replaced by the blind empress, the dragon of the west, conqueror of a thousand kingdoms. When Gara entered the room with his escort, he instantly felt intimidated by the place. His trip in the empire already showed him that the west enjoyed gigantic buildings, but this was insane. The room was at least two-story tall, the sheer number of guards patrolling here was overkill, and on the throne stood a woman that was told to be the most powerful Kinoichi to ever walk the face of the earth, her close second standing by her side. I wonder if coming here was such a good idea. Glancing at his escort, he could see Tamari looking at the columns in awe, Kankuro gazing anxiously at Fuu, the war lady, war master of the empire, and Mitsuri looking ill at ease. With a sigh and a prayer, Gara began his walk to his possible impending doom. Once close enough to the throne, he bowed deeply, waiting for the empress to talk, and his wait was short. The Zika gave don't know, what do I owe the pleasure? Asked a powerful woman in a polite yet warm tone. Empress Sama, I am here today to know what your intentions toward Wind Country are. Our daimyo is growing nervous, the strength of your army is well known. If you are worried for your independence, then do not worry anymore, I do not intend to invade Wind Country. That is most fortunate, I am sure my lord will be relieved. Perhaps trade agreements would help cement the peace between our countries. We are most interested in the goods from the West. Trade is always welcome for it ensures peace. Hinata smiled behind her veil. She had them just where she wanted, and it had been easier than she had hoped. Someone would have to go to win to negotiate those treaties, which in turn would give Hinata a good insight of the politics of the East, without revealing herself too much. With a small wave of her hand, Hinata motioned Fuel closer and, once close enough, began to discuss quietly with her. After a minute, Fu left the room. My right hand, Fu, will accompany you and represent me in those negotiations. She will be ready shortly and you can then leave at your convenience. Though, I would be most pleased if you stayed a bit and enjoyed the facilities at your disposal. Gara bowed, thanking the Empress. After five years of politic, he knew how to discern a polite dismissal and a gracious invitation, and this was definitely the later. He kept replaying the exchange in his head as a guard led them to their apartments. Once there, he sat down in a very comfortable armchair, sighing heavily. Immediately noticing, Mitsuri went to the young Kage, worried. Arakan. What is it? She was pleased. Pleased enough to invite us to stay as long as we want. I said something that satisfied her greatly, and I just can't put my finger on it. Do you think there's something fishy? Asked Kankuro, still clearly nervous. I'd be careful with these guys. I heard the Empress can summon dragons and that the war lady managed to defeat one in duel. That's a show of power, not of subtlety. Remarked Tamari. Is there any other thing we should be wary of? Yes sis, there is. The Empress is sending us a Jinchuriki that is actually in good terms with her Bijuu, she can take the Shichibi's form any time she wants if our reports are accurate. Oh. That's bad. But she is supposed to negotiate a treaty, right? What would be the point of lying on that? If they want to invade us, wouldn't they first try to intimidate us into giving in? But they would. Said Gara. The Empress wants this treaty. But not for trade alone. Could it be she is interested in the East? But if so, why not directly invade it? Perhaps it is knowledge she seeks in any way, I don't think we have to worry about a war. My instinct tells me she has nothing against the sand. She will leave us a peace at least for now. So I we might as well do what she said, enjoy the facilities. I saw a fine restaurant on the way, would you like to try it Mitsuri? Oh, I I, I would love it answered a blushing and smiling Mitsuri. Gara let a rare smile spread on his face as he offered his arm to the woman and began to lead her away. Well, I'm gonna see if they have hot springs. With that, Tamari took her leave. Hmm, might as well see what they have to eat. And with that, Kankuro left the room as well. The Sunda delegation stayed in the empire for three days before beginning their journey back to the sand with Fu and an escort of the best soldiers of the empire. There were four soldiers with Fu, one man and three women, all bearing the crest of the empire, a coiled dragon, on their armor. This of course made Kankuro very nervous, especially considering that Fu and her escort weren't talking much. But that was not enough to stop Tamari. As the night fell, they reached the border of Wind Country and quickly set up a camp. Tamari, unable to hold her curiosity any longer, asked a question that was running through her mind. Do you sand, you see mill at ease, is something bothering you? This instantly made Gara cringe, fearing that the war lady would feel insulted by the lack of a respectful honorific. Instead, Fu just looked a little more pissed. You kidding me? Of course there's something bothering me. While I'm away I can't be with my girl. Your girl? Asked Tamari, lost between amusement and surprise. A gigantic grin began to spread on Fu's face. Yeah, the hot lady on the shiny chair. 
At this, all of Suna's ninjas stopped, looking at the mint-haired girl with shock written all over their face, even Gara had lost his impassibility as nervousness began to take him over. She's the Empress's lover, if anything happens to her, I'm losing my head. What next? She's going to say she's here to abduct someone. But Suri, who was finally coming out of her shock, began thinking back to what Gara had said a few days earlier. Um, Fu sama Chill out girly, I'm not so formal. There, very well. Um, Fu san Empress Sama could have sent anyone of some trust to negotiate such treaty, if it's not asking too much, could you tell us why she sent you instead? Simple, kiddo. My hottie of an empress knows someone that we suspect is in the east, so I'm gonna look around. If I find something on the guy and I see him, I'll jump him, tie him up and bring him back to the empire so we can have our way with him for a full freaking week. But Suri and Tamari quickly blushed a deep shade of red, Gara face palmed, chastising himself for asking it, while Kankuro muttered lucky bastard. Meanwhile Fu's troops were laughing slightly, clearly used to their leader's antics. Mitsuri, finally registering how she had been called, answered back slightly irritated. I'm not a kid. To everyone's surprise, Fu's expression went from an amused grin to a much more subdued one. Have you already had to kill 2,000 men to ensure peace? Mitsuri, shocked, could only shake her head. Fu, with a pained and tired smile looked at her. See? You still got some of your innocence, so you're still a kid. And I hope you never lose it completely. Because there's no going back. Silence settled on the camp. Of course the Suna ninja knew some veterans of the past wars, but they couldn't really relate much to them. And here, before them, was a woman no older than them that went through the horrors of war and far worse. It was unsettling, to say the least. Tamari, wishing to change subject, went back to what Fu had said. Erm, and that guy you're looking for, do you have a name or something? Maybe we can help. No offense but we're not allies yet. Besides, that would give way too much leverage on the Empress. Add to it the fact that our guy was a tad bit wanted last time my girl heard of him, I'm sure you can understand why I don't really want to talk about him openly. Now Fu was a bit better but still way more collected than she used to be. What do you mean, wanted? Is he a criminal? Asked Mitsuri, now wondering why the Empress would know such an individual. No, not in the least. Even if, for some, his very existence was a crime. At this, Gara immediately tensed. He is a Jinchuriki, just like the two of us, isn't he? Fu barely nodded. It was the last time she talked that night as she lost herself in her thoughts. The wind daimyo was shifting uneasily on his seat. Seated in front of him was Fu, smiling as ever with a dangerous spark of mischievousness glowing in her eyes. The man hoped for a trade agreement, but he was not prepared to meet an envoy from the Empire so soon, and the woman across from him was fully aware of that. The funniest of it all was that he had Gara to thank for putting him in such an uncomfortable position, since he accomplished his mission. Finally deciding to act, the daimyo turned toward his military counterpart. Thank you Kazika Gay Dono, you did very well. I will not hold you any longer, as I am sure you are very busy taking care of Suna. Gara knew a dismissal when he heard one, and this was one of the coldest he ever heard, but then again, this man would be nothing without the constant work of his troops. With a polite bow, Gara left the room. Turning back to his guest, the feudal lord noticed that her expression had shifted to annoyance. You know, if you treat your troops that way, they're bound to turn against you. Maybe you should take a few lessons in management. The daimyo sat there, bewildered, before growing very cold. You should learn some respect girl, be sure that I will mention your behavior to the empress. At this, to his dismay, her smile came back even wider. Well don't mind me, feel free to do so, she'll forgive me after some hot sweaty dot fun. Said Fu, almost purring the last part. Hearing that, the man's first reaction was to look at her with saucer-sized eyes. Then the implications dawned on him and a look of horror made its way onto his face. She's the empress's lover. With such a relation she could get away with anything. It was at this point that Fu decided she had had enough fun and that it was time to get down to business. Alright. I'm here to negotiate trade agreements, so let's go with that. First, I'll need to know exactly what can be sold between our countries. You know, the usual. Raw materials, craft products, those kind of things. Next I'll need the average price and eventually we'll have to set up the trade taxes, determine the trading routes and build the necessary infrastructure's weight. Why are you looking so lost? Oh boy, this is gonna take longer than I thought. Do you at least have a counselor that knows something of trading? The daimyo, relieved to find a cue to discharge the affair on someone else's shoulders, quickly sent for his advisors before excusing himself to go administrate his country. As three advisors sat in front of her, Fu took a deep breath before diving into a sea of information. To the container's dismay, the three old idiots were constantly beating around the bush for a straightforward girl like Fu, it was infuriating. After a while she snapped. Enough. Arg. Can't you people just get to the point? 
So far all you told me is that you have a lot of freaking sand and some exotic fruits. Just cut the crap and speak damn it. I'm half tempted to declare war on this oversized beach just to make you shut the fuck up. The three immediately began to panic, two of them frantically trying to calm her down, while the third went to his lord in an all-out panic. Soon after, the feudal lord came back with his advisor, looking just as panicked, and began his clumsy attempts to calm the imperial envoy. Through this all, Fu just remained in her seat with a blank face. Finally, as the four men stopped to catch their breath, she stood up, informed her host that she would retire for the night, left the room, and settled down in the room that had been prepared for her. After a short while, a howl of laughter escaped her room, shaking the whole palace. During a whole week, Fu tried to obtain more information on the wind country's exportable products, but it looked like the first day had made them overly cautious and even slower. It was infuriating. The longer she was trapped there, the longer she would be away from Hinata, and she knew she'd never find any intelligence on the Yuzumaki her love wanted so much to know about. Finally, after a week, her salvation arrived. The fire daimyo came for a diplomatic visit. It was wonderful chance to take her mind off her frustration, and she was not about pass it up. Sasuke stood at the ready in front of Kanoha's extended council. Normally, only the most important and experienced shinobi would gather, but since it was an extremely important affair for the whole village, soon a day had permitted the civilians to attend too. They all sat in an eerie silence, waiting for Sasuke's report, hoping for the best, but knowing that he had failed. Finally breaking the silence, the Hokage spoke. So? He refused. Sighs of sadness were heard, some gritted their teeth. Soon a day was at loss of words, but she needed to know. B but why? Doesn't he want to be Hokage? Maybe we could get rid of that seal and allow him to be a ninja again, so why pass up this chance? After what happened on the marketplace he doesn't want to see blood ever again. He is fine with his way of living. I tried everything I could, but it was all for naught. He has changed. The one I left six years ago and the man I talked to last week are two different beings. Yuzumaki Naruto was brash, obnoxious, sometimes idiotic and overly enthusiastic. Namaki's Naruto is calm, quiet, intelligent and wise. These are perfect qualities for a ninja. Why does he refuse to return? Asked a civilian counselor. Because of the past and the future. He still resents the village for the way he was treated and feels we are being hypocritical to call him back now that his father is known. He also believes he can help bring about peace from where he stands and that joining Kanoha would be wasting such an opportunity. When I arrived, he had already signed a peace treaty between Iwa and Kumo, and when I left Kusa and Aim were requesting his mediation to settle a dispute without bloodshed. He does not wish to fight anymore, he wishes to avoid conflicts. Is there any way to convince him to come back? Asked Choza Akimichi in desperation. There is only one. Everyone perked up, looking intently at the Achiha. And what is it? Find Hayuga Hinata. All hope was crushed and everyone looked down in despair. Except one man. Has he any information on the possible whereabouts of my daughter? I do not know Hiyashi Sama. Very well, I shall go talk to him. Maybe we can find something if we share what we have. Grabbing his cane, Hiyashi stood up with difficulty, his daughter Hanabi quickly coming to his aid. Hiyashi, in desperation, had joined his clansmen in the search of his eldest and, following one of the few leads they had, had been injured, his right leg crushed under tons of rock. His search had taken its toll on both his body and mind, leaving him with premature wrinkles and long strands of white hair. Though his search had been a failure, though he had no more leads, though every single one told him it was probably too late, he never lost hope. Tsum looked at the prematurely aged clan head with pity in her eyes. The Ashi, she's probably dead. Just stop hoping, it's becoming an obsession. At that, the Ashi just scoffed. She is not dead. She is strong. I may not have seen it at the time, but to withstand all of the abuse these traitorous old monkeys bestowed on her and still manage as she did, she has a rare strength. Besides, she is just like her mother, gentle but unyielding. She is alive and I will find her, even if it's the last thing I do. But that Hiyashi Hayuga left the council room, supported by his daughter, to prepare for his travel to Wave. As it was customary in such occasion, Fu had been invited to eat dinner with the two daimyo, and, of course, the Fire Lord was very interested. The Western Empire? Incredible. I heard many rumors on this place, is it true that the Empress is a ninja capable of summoning dragons? That's true. Some were really arrogant, but she quickly put them back into place with a simple glare. A simple glare? Yep, she glared down a 50-foot-long dragon. I know it's incredible, and I wouldn't believe it either had I not been there myself. How fascinating. I also heard she is blind yet can see in people's souls. Well, that's something I cannot talk about, I have to keep everything about her eyes a secret. Oh, I understand. If I may ask, why have you come? 
I was sent here to negotiate a trade agreement, but well let's say it hasn't gone as planned. Oh, I know what you mean. My wind counterpart is not at ease with trade, he fares much better when managing his treasury. So he delegates the trade negotiations to his advisors, and well you met them. Sadly, I have. At this, the wind daimyo began shifting uncomfortably in his seat. Oh, but I have an idea. Turning to his host, the energetic old man smiled. Maybe I could represent both of our countries. We already have trade agreements so I am quite familiar your country's products, and the prospect of trading with the empire is quite exciting. What do you think, friend? Oh, that is a most excellent idea. I know I can trust you on this matter, and it will be most beneficial to both of our countries. Exclaimed the now invigorated leader. So interjected few. I won't have to deal with the three advisors anymore. I won't die of boredom. The fire daimyo chuckled at that. No, you will negotiate with me. Perhaps a figure of authority would help in the negotiations, one that is seen by all as wise and reliable. Are you thinking of Namika's Sama? Oh, I was waiting for an opportunity to finally meet him. Yes, he is the one I was thinking about. I greatly enjoyed our talk when I went to meet him, and his impartiality will ensure that the negotiations go on flawlessly. Maybe we should take this occasion to strengthen the ties between Kanoha and Suna. So the Kazikage and Hokage will come too, very well. I will send word to Gara. I am sure he will be most pleased, it has been a while since he last had the chance to see Namika's Sama, and I know they are good friends. Excellent, I will also send word to Tsuna Day, she will be just as pleased. When shall we go? We should go as soon as Gara arrives with our escort, I will write the letter as soon as we finish diner. Tsuna Day was sitting in her office, looking out the window. Her desk was as clean as the day it was bought, not even a single piece of paperwork was left. When Naruto was banished, she began to do her work to take her mind off her problems, and it quickly became a habit, and now she had too much time to think about what she could have done better. She had finished her work two hours ago and was looking since then at the village. A village she didn't see anymore. Everyone knew she was empty, no more than a shell slowly waiting to die. Guilt was plaguing her since she was forced to banish Naruto, but it began to kill her after she banished Hinata. Just because I was too fucking drunk to look at what I was signing. She died two years ago when she received a report. It spoke of a woman matching Hinata's description. Dead. And her eyes had disappeared. She had kept the information secret, only telling Hiashi, but he had said it was not Hinata. But she knew. She heard the door of her office open and knew instantly who it was. After all, she was the last to willingly enter the office, something not even Jiraiya was doing anymore. What is it Shizun? We received word from the fire daimyo. You are required in wave. The fire and wind lords will be there to negotiate a trade agreement with an envoy of the empire and wish to take this occasion to deepen the alliance between Kanoha and Suna. I see. Any other requests? Yes. The message said to bring along representation from our major clans. I see. I will prepare then. Suna Day Sensei will you please tell me what's eating you? It's been two years. No. You should go. Take your day off. Without another word, the Hokage got up and disappeared in a swirl of leaves. Naruto expected many visitors. Ambassadors, mercenaries, repentant criminals, even some feudal lords. But not Hiyashi Hayuga. His very presence brought back the guilt he felt, and he couldn't bring himself to meet his eyes. The tea was now on the table, but no words were uttered. Hiyashi finally grew tired of the silence. As much as I enjoy silence, I have not come here for that. Then, if I may ask, what brings you here? Asked Naruto tiredly. This made Hiyashi quirk an eyebrow. I heard you are searching for my daughter as well, I wish to compare what we know, perhaps it can give us a lead. Hearing that, Naruto immediately perked up, shame no longer in his eyes. Getting up at blinding speed, he went to his bedroom and opened his desk, quickly gathering what he had and read to the living room. This is all I have, I already investigated these leads, but maybe one of us has a determining element that the other lacks. To Hiyashi's pleasure, the young man was showing great dedication at finding Hinata. As they compared their leads, they found most of what they had, they both knew. However, little details seemed to indicate a general direction. To the west. Why would she go there? Wondered Naruto aloud. It was nothing more than a gigantic warzone at the time, but the blind empress rose soon after maybe she sought solace in the newly created state. If so, then we must seek an audience with the empress. I will not leave my child in pain, these seals must be dealt with. But father what if she doesn't want to come back? Asked Hanabi. She is still technically banished, so she is free. But I at least want to free her of her seals. At that moment, someone knocked on the door. Quickly excusing himself, Naruto went to the entrance and opened the door. The fist that came through caught him square in the face, breaking his nose before the follow-up left hook sent him stumbling into the living room. Through the door came Inuzuka Kiba. Yuzumaki. 
growled the fear-looking ninja. He had matured, but his hatred was still burning. Gone was the jacket of his childhood. He was now wearing black pants and sandals, the Kanoha flak jacket with fur added to the collar and shoulders, his arms left exposed. Before he could make another move on the blonde, Hanabi blocked his path. What the hell is wrong with you Kiba? Hanabi you should be with me, not protecting him. It's his fault that she's been banished. No, it's not. I already told you, he is innocent of our elder's cruelty. Before Kiba could retort, he was suddenly jerked back, taking a fist to the face from an angry Sakura. Out of respect for the house, though, she controlled her strength. You bastard. How dare you. He is just as much of a victim as her. Shoving Kiba out of the house, she went to Naruto who was nursing his nose, grunting in pain. Cracking an eye open, Naruto looked at his former teammate. Oh, hey Sakura. No need to worry, I heal fast. Besides, he's right. No, he's not. It is not your fault. Naruto stayed quiet while Sakura was tending to his nose, putting it back in place and healing it. Hiashi, finally getting up, went outside of the house. Kiba's shouts were heard, followed shortly after by a powerful shockwave. When the clan head came back in, he looked slightly satisfied. I convinced Kiba San to leave you alone. He shouldn't pull that kind of stunt again. Thank you for your concern, Hiashi Sama, but I would have preferred it if Kiba was left unharmed. Then you are an even bigger idiot than before. Entering the house was Shikamarinara. Gone was the laziness of his childhood, the Jonin was now full of determination. The Nara was wearing the regular Kanoha Jonin outfit. Hey Shika. Guess I didn't change that much. So, why you all here? The Nara could only sigh. We were sent along with Lee, he is currently keeping Kiba at bay. The Wind and Fire Daimyo are coming here to deepen the alliance between the Leaf and the Sand and to negotiate a trade agreement with the Empire. Heard of it. Instantly, Naruto was on his feet, a spark in his eyes. The Empire? This could be my chance. Your chance to what? The Ashi Sama and I crossed our information and we have a lead, Hinata might be in the Empire. Shikamaru just stayed silent, looking at the once proud blonde, seeing only a desperate and obsessed man. With a sigh, he exited the room. Naruto was feeling more tired than ever. Feeling a hand on his shoulder, he saw Sakura smiling hesitantly. You know she is a lot like you so she's surely out there, waiting for you. Naruto smiled weakly at his former teammate. Thanks Sakura. I needed that. Now that the whole ordeal had been closed, Sakura seemed very uncomfortable, no wonder plagued by guilt. Naruto, wanting to relieve her of her burden, thought of the best way to do so. Sakura, since you're here, how about we catch up? Naruto was a little less cheery than he used to be, but still much more than how he really felt. The pinket, guessing something was wrong, nodded her head in agreement. Motioning for her to follow him, Naruto led her to a nearby lake, talking lightly along the way. All the while, Sakura kept picking up signs that worried her, and, once they reached the lake, the nurse and her finally took over. Alright, cut the crap, what's gotten you so worked up? For a moment, Naruto considered denying Anu problem, instead he just collapsed, crying. Pyu was feeling like she was alive again. After a whole week of staying still, she could finally move about, and she would be damned if she didn't take full advantage of this occasion, but that didn't mean she would be rudely running around screaming childishly in joy, no, she was far past that she would be flying. Ah. I missed this. Before the bemused daimyo, the mint-haired container was flying above the group, doing loops, spinning in mid-air, and all sorts of other acrobatic figures, all the while smiling and laughing. They had been walking for three days already, and the imperial emissary had only touched the ground to sleep and eat, so it came quite as a surprise when they saw her land and begin to walk normally. The fire daimyo, curious, decided to inquire as to the reasons of this sudden change. Pyu san Why are you suddenly landing? Are you feeling alright? Oh yeah, no problem, I'm fine. Answered Fu, waving her hand dismissively. It's just that Xiao Mei is getting pissed and wanted to sleep. Xiao Mei? Yeah, the Shichibi. You talk to your Bijuu? Why, yes. He's quite nice when you get to know him. He can be a bit grumpy, but other than that, he's a fun guy. The Suna delegation was thrown of guard with that declaration. Yes, they had heard that the war lady was on good terms with her Bijuu, but to think they were actually friends like her words implied. It was unexpected and somewhat alarming. The daimyo however, were more curious than frightened. Really? I always thought the Bijuu were bloodthirsty demons, some kind of divine punishment. Not at all, they are sentient beings, attuned to the energies of our world. In fact, Chame told me the Rakuto created them from the original energies of a greater being, the Juubi. Fascinating. But then, why did Kayubi attack Kanoha? That's what's bothering Chame. From what he knows, Kayubi shouldn't even have been free. Answered Fu, becoming thoughtful. Gara frowned, and the daimyo looked at each other, troubled. What do you mean? 
Ashurama Senju gave the Bijuu to the villages as a mean to ensure peace, and from what Jaume managed to gather, Kayubi was kept inside Konoha, sealed in Hashirama's wife, Mito Yuzumaki. The Fire Lord's eyes widened at that. Me did you say Yuzumaki? And Namaka's Sama is linked to the Shadame. Huh? How come? Naruto only recently took his father's name. Answered Gara. Before, he was Yuzumaki Naruto. It was only due to years of training that Fuu kept her excitement at bay, at hearing the name of Hinata's long-lost crush, instead taking an expression of surprise. Uh. But isn't Namek is the name of the Yandame Hokage? Yes it is. From what I understood, the Sandame gave him his mother's maiden name to keep him safe from Iwa. But, if he's from Kanoha, then how can I trust him not to be partial? At this, the fire daimyo lowered his head, Gara clenched slightly his fist, and all of the Suna delegation showed various level of anger or coldness. Yes, go with it, show to a foreign envoy how low this village has fallen. The reason is Konoha banished him. What do you mean Daimyo-sama? Why would they banish their greatest hero's son? Even if they didn't know of his father, they would have probably seen some kind of familiarity. They should have seen it, but the boy was still as the container of the Kayubi, and because of that the village hated him and mistreated him. They went as far as to seal away his chakra, destroying any future opportunity to ever use the ninja arts again. Sigh in the end, he became a wise man known throughout the elemental nations. He even became a hero in Iwa after he pacified their relations with Kumo, he even brought these two villages to sign a peace treaty. Wow, sounds impressive. At least I'll be able to relate to him. You know, the containers stick together Thinji. Just to know, where's the guy living? In a small island nation, Wave. From what I gathered, when he was still a genin of Kanoha, he and his team saved them from slavery at the hand of a corrupt businessman. He was so revered there that they even gave his name to the bridge that connect the island to the mainland. When he was banished, they took him in. Not caring of Kayubi? No, they don't care. These people are truly admirable. Indeed. When shall we arrive? If we keep this base, in less than a week. By now, soon a day should be in wave along with the heads of the main clans in Kanoha and their heirs. I see. Haim will want to know about it, a Hayuga presence is bound to cause trouble. Though, if I know her, she would be capable of glaring down even the most hostile Hayuga, and if they try to use the seal, well surprise. But the somewhat dark look in her eyes, Fu went on. As they crossed the bridge, Tsuna Day felt nervousness washing over her. She was determined to tell Naruto the truth, but how would he take it? She wondered if he even could accept it. Seeing the bridge the first time, she had been surprised to see its name, she had heard of Naruto's accomplishment in these lands, but never thought he would be that deeply loved. Now, it was another reminder of her failure. Looking to the end of the bridge, she saw four figures standing at attention. As they came closer, she saw it was her student, Sakura Hiruno, along with Shikamaru Nara, Rock Lee and Kiba in Yuzuka. Through the years, Sakura's choice of dress had changed. She now wore a red Hayori over her flak jacket, along with black pants and low-heeled sandals, on her arms were only plated gloves, her hair gathered in a low ponytail reaching the middle of her back. Lee, though he kept most of his eternal green spandex style, now had a more weathered look, his face now more mature, metal plates protecting his forearms. Looking at the group, she could already guess that Kiba did something brash and idiotic. Finally nearing them, she saw Sakura take a few steps forwards. Report. Ordered the Hokage. Okage-sama, contact has been established. As expected, clan head Hayuga Hiyashi is present along with Chunin Hayuga Hanabi and is currently being housed by Namika's Naruto. Hokage-sama, I must report that Chunin Inuzuka Kiba showed great hostility to the negotiator. Be more precise. He punched Naruto before any word could be exchanged. The glare Tsuna Day sent to the Inuzuka would have been enough to melt any lesser man, but Kiba had learned to resist long ago and only answered with a snarl. That is not all Hokage-sama. What now? He informed Naruto of Iruka sensei's status in the Ichiraku family situation, blaming it on him. The moment Sakura finished talking, everyone fell to their knees, trembling in fear. Tsuna Day was swarming the area with killing intent, the glare she sent to Kiba would have been enough to kill many weathered ninja, and the young Inuzuka would have died, had he not faced already the legendary wrath of the Senju princess. But that did not stop him from cowering in fear. The year after Naruto's banishment, fear had dissipated, leaving hatred in its wake. On the first anniversary of the marketplace slaughter, a mob of grief-stricken villagers formed and attacked the Ichiraku Raymond stand, Iruka being the only one to defend them. The three had been trapped inside the building as it was set ablaze by a powerful fire jutsu. The shop collapsed before anything could be done. The jutsu was so powerful that they were burned to the bones. Not even their teeth were recovered from the melted remains of the building. Another cause of guilt for Tsunade, one she had tried to spare Naruto. Tsuna Day was about to march on Kiba, intent on ending the man's life when a strained voice was heard. Granny don't. 
Looking up, she was shocked to see Naruto. He was wearing the same clothes as last time she came, but there were bags under his haunted eyes. Seeing him like that, Tsunade felt what remained of her heartbreak. The boy went through so much pain, and yet there were still some to inflict more suffering on him. And the worst was that Naruto would probably end up defending them. Naruto smiled weakly, a feeble attempt at hiding his pain, before bowing his head. If you would follow me, we have prepared houses for you to stay in. In a deathly silence, the Kanoha delegation followed the fallen ninja. Those that still had doubts lost them, for only a man could look so crushed when faced with the death of his loved ones. But Kiba stood his ground, unforgiving, failing to overcome the loss of his teammate, refusing to accept the fact that Naruto was a victim. Following this shell of a man, the clan heads and their heirs really felt for the first time the burden of pain weighing on the young Nemecus's life. After a week of travel, the feudal lords finally reached Wave and crossed its colossal bridge. Wow, that bridge is huge. Commented Fu. Indeed Fu san I have already seen it withstand a furious storm, the likes of which wasn't seen in over a century, and not even bulge. It was truly impressive. Its builder, Tazuna san often boast, claiming that only divine fury could break his bridge. He's not that far from the truth. From what I can see and what my chakra tells me, this bridge is strong enough to endure at least two Bijuu bomb, even the hidden village's main buildings aren't that strong. That's one hell of a piece of work. The elderly Daimyo chuckled as he looked at the imperial envoy who was looking around curiously. It amazed him how such a powerful general could still act so childishly at times. In a way, it was refreshing for the old politician. In his time, the old Daimyo had seen too many betrayals, too much bloodshed, feared too many times for his life and for his family's safety, the innocence displayed in front of him was like a pond of water in a desert. But he was no fool, he could already guess it was a way to escape the guilt great warriors often felt. Hearing something at the front, the elderly man looked up. In front of the group were five men, visibly Nukin and belonging to the former Akatsuki if you were to judge on their cloaks. Gara narrowed his eyes at the sight. Isam Hashigaki of Kiri, Kakuzu of Taki, Haiden of Yu, Didara of Iwa and Ajenin. Said Jin and immediately began screaming in rage. Who the fuck do you think you are you fucking freak? I'm the mighty Yazu. Yeah, yeah, whatever. What are you boys doing here? Asked Fu. You wouldn't attack a poor maiden and two daimyo, now would you? Hn, life is hard. Answered Didara. And we need money to live. I'm sure you wouldn't mind leaving a few coins, especially to avoid trouble with us. We are all Kage level, after all. Added Kakuzu. Fu, not really impressed, turned to Gara. Gara san, would it bother you if I took care of this trash? Are you sure you don't need reinforcements? Inquired the Kazikage. Oh, you know, I'm not nicknamed the War Lady just for my good looks. Answered Fu with a smile. Suddenly, she disappeared, reappearing in the middle of the Akatsuki, a bow staff in hand. Before any of the criminals could recover from the shock, the staff collided with Kissam's head, the sickening sound of broken bone following as the man's lifeless body flew to the left. With a spike of speed, she struck a Kakuzu, carving five clear holes in the man's chest, as he began bringing his hands up. Aiden immediately charged at her as Dadara took to the air on one of his clay birds. As the immortal closed on her, Fu ducked under the scythe and slammed her fist into the Jashinist's jaw, before picking him up by the collar and throwing him toward the blonde bomber. Faltering under the impact, Dadara barely managed to catch his teammate. H.N., what the hell is that? It was supposed to be a freaking diplomatic envoy. Like I would fucking know, now get me down there, I wanna sacrifice that bitch. She can't do anything to me, I'm a fucking immortal. Looking down, they saw Fu, her bow in her right hand, her left arm extended toward them, and in the open palm of her hand, a black sphere of destruction. Survive this. With a mighty roar of pure power, the sphere transformed into a powerful ray of destruction, engulfing the two criminals and disintegrating them. As the frightening attack died down, Fu let her arm fall to her side, before shifting her gaze to the last member of the squad still alive. The boy, no older than 15, was shaking and crying. Seeing the inhumanly powerful Kinoichi landing her eyes on him, he tried to beg for mercy, but his mouth wouldn't obey, only letting out an incoherent mess of stutters and cries. That lost kid. Without another word, Fu went back to her trek, sealing her bow in a parchment. Looking at her retreating back for a few seconds, the boy broke out in an all-out sprint, tears flowing from his eyes. Looking behind her, Fu saw that the daimyo and their escort had yet to move, while her personal guards had already caught up. With a cheesy grin, Fu turned to them. Hey, what are you waiting for? We gotta go. Finally shaking off their shock, they began walking once again, a quick glance to the side, informing them that the mighty Sword of the Mist had already been retrieved and the bodies thrown into the sea. Passing the bloody spot with some uncertainty, they followed the War Lady. Wave was usually peaceful, but what happened on the bridge put everyone on edge. The Shinobi Delegation of Kanoha H. 
Bad gathered at the end of the bridge, anxious to know what had caused such a fearsome display of power. Looking around her, Tsunade looked at her troops. The clan heads hadn't changed that much in six years, but their heirs Eno was now wearing her flak jacket, a purple skirt falling to mid-tight, Fishna covering her arms down to the elbow. Doji followed the Akamichi tradition, wearing mighty armor with plates added on the fabric falling on his thighs and back. Shino stood to the side, an open cloak showing his flak jacket underneath it, the hood obscuring his face, leaving only the lower part of his face visible. Heiress of the Inuzuka clan, Hana stood with pride, her three ninkin at her side. Not much had changed in the young woman, having only added a bit of fur to the collar of her jacket. Looking at her personal escort, Tsunade wondered if she chose wisely to keep this group united. Tenton looked battle-ready, but then again, she was Jonan. Wearing a traditional Kanoha uniform, she looked deadly. Next to her was Niji, wearing a cream kimono, his forehead protector proudly displayed on his head. One would think such a state of dress would hamper his movements and make him less efficient in battle, but it was quite the contrary. Sasuke was there having retired as soon as he returned, the youngest was the new representative of his clan. Hearing gasps of surprise, Tsunade turned to look at the bridge, only to see the escort of the feudal lords coming their way safely. At the front was a mint-haired woman, probably in her late teens, walking toward them without a care in the world. Finally noticing the group of Konoha shinobi, the woman waved lazily her hand and, once at voice reach, greeted them. Hey, you're the Konoha group, right? I'm the imperial emissary. Happily chipped few. When she got no reply, she shot the group a questioning glance, tilting her head to the side. You alright? You all look like you saw some kind of freaking ghost. Tsunade took upon herself to answer. We are alright, thank you for your concern. We, however, are worried about the explosion that happened not too long ago. Would you happen to know what happened? Oh, that. Don't worry big booby lady, twas just my bijou bomb. Said Fu, waving her hand dismissively shocking the whole Kanoha delegation with the nickname she gave to Tsunade. Kiba snarled when he understood she was a container before muttering under his breath, fucking demon whore. In an instant, the bridge was flooded with hatred and fury, as Fu jumped high in the air, bringing her staff down towards Kiba's head. Before the metallic end of the staff could shatter the head of the Inuzuka, another staff blocked it, the sound of the impact almost deafening. Landing, Fu glared viciously at the newcomer, snarling in anger. Stand aside if you want to live. That I cannot do. I understand you must have suffered in your former village, but I cannot allow you to shed blood on this land. This island is a symbol of peace, I will not let blood tarnish it. Looking more at the man that blocked her, Fu blushed slightly. He was tall, with sun-kissed hair and deep blue eyes, three whisker marks on each cheek, and an expression of calm etched on his face, though she could see he went through great pain recently. Bringing her staff back, Fu schooled her features. Very well. Out of respect for a fellow container, I will not kill this man. Turning her gaze to Tsunade, Fu's face hardened once again. But you'd be wise to keep this fool in check, I am not the most patient woman, and neither is the Empress. Moved by anger at being so harshly demeaned, Kiba failed to listen to reason. Ha. And who do you fucking think you are? Just some fucking no-name D. Before he could end his insult, Kiba was interrupted by a crushing wave of chakra, leaving almost all on the bridge struggling to keep their footing. When she spoke, Fu's voice was calm but laced with overwhelming power and authority, and her eyes promised death. I am Fu Takamushi, container of the Shichibi, first general of the empire, the war lady of the west, empress consort, destroyer of a thousand armies. You would do well to remember it. Letting the pressure fall, Fu turned to Naruto with a pleasant smile. Now, Namaka-san, why don't you give me a tour? I'm a bit curious of this land. Nodding, Naruto began to lead the imperial envoy through the crowd. Once they were far enough, Tsunade sent a vicious glare toward Kiba. You fool, you really have a talent to insult those you shouldn't. Hey, how could I know the Empress was a demon fucker? Before Tsunade could express her rage with her fists, a blade appeared against Kiba's throat. One of Fu's guards, who had yet to leave, was threatening him with her blade. Use that tongue of yours to insult the Empress or Fu Sama one more time, and you will lose it. Without another word, the guards left. It was at this moment that Gara, who had just joined the group with the daimyo's escort, decided to talk. Okage Dono, you would do well to keep this Chunin in check. Before we arrived, Fu San executed 4S rank missing Nin in less than a minute, she is not to be taken lightly. Now, if you will excuse us, we must settle down. Tsunade left out a heavy sigh. It's going to be a very long week. Walking down the road, Fu and Naruto talked lightly, mostly about the lifestyle in Wave and the Empire. Slowly, they began talking of the way they were treated in their villages, how they were hurt, hated, and demeaned. The feeling of kinship she felt toward Naruto amazed Fu, she never thought she would feel so understood again, and yet here she was, sharing her pain with a man she had met barely an hour ago. 
It was both frightening and comforting, the feeling she knew him when she barely met him. A moment of silence came as they walked along the shoreline, enjoying each other's presence. What is eating at you? Softly asked Few. I recently learned that some that cared for me back in Kanoha are dead. Slaughtered a year after I left. Naruto was looking down, the pain overwhelming. Few's hand on his shoulder made him look up and see her kind smile of sympathy. Knowing he had someone to share his pain, he felt better. That's not all, is it? Yeah. Sigh soon after I was banished, a girl that stood up for me was banished. From what I gathered, she was branded with two potentially deadly seals, one of them even forbid her to be pregnant. I just I wish I could protect her when I think back about it, she was always there for me in the academy leaving her notes at my door to help me that kind of things. I I even think she was one of the few to leave me a birthday gift when no one else would. Yu smiled gently. She knew who he was talking about, but she had to be sure. And what was her name? Hayuga Hinata. Few you know the Empress, right? Well her father and I talked recently and she might be in the Empire. Please help me, I I just want to find her to help her I. There's more isn't it? Why yeah she she was the first to believe in me, she had feelings for me if she still have them, then I I want to see if. If it works out. Yeah. I'll see what I can do, okay. Naruto smiled his first true smile in weeks, genuinely happy that his hopes may not have been in vain. They walked a bit more in silence, enjoying the calmness of the sea and the warm feeling of belonging in their hearts. As they walked, they came upon a strange sight, Inuzuka Kiba and Ino Yamanaka talking quite animatedly. Coming closer, they realized they were so engrossed in their talking they hadn't noticed them. I mean, what the hell with you beating Naruto up? Even when I was freaking out about Kayubi I never blamed what happened to Hinata on him. Just leave me fucking alone. Hell no. I'm in charge of your mental health and comfort, so you'd better begin talking dog boy. I I arg, fuck. Sigh I just can't stand it, he just goes on like nothing happened, like he doesn't give a damn about Hinata or Ruka sensei That just makes me want to punch him. Have you even seen him? I've been here for a week and I've already seen him cry at night three times. 3. Hanabi told me he had investigated nearly every lead on Hinata they had, and even a few they hadn't, he even put three freaking villages on her trail. As for Aruka sensei he didn't know until you dumped it on him. Then then, if his life is so goddamn hard, why doesn't he end it all? Why doesn't he just kill himself? It was at this point that Naruto decided to interfere, making his presence known. Because, Kiba, I cannot. Pieces like the bridge you crossed coming here. It must be built to protect the generations to come. I go on, not to satisfy my pride, but to avoid meaningless deaths in the future, to make sure no child will lose their parents in a war that could have been so easily avoided. Once peace is settled, if I fail to find Hinata, then I don't know maybe. With a heavy sigh, Naruto resumed his walk, Fuu at his side, leaving the two Konoha just shocked. Looking at his retreating back, Kiba felt remorse and shame biting at his heart. I, I was wrong. You think he'll ever forgive me? I don't know. Try, maybe he will. Farther down the beach, Fuu and Naruto came to a stop. With a heavy sigh, the blonde said. Fuu I, I'm not even sure I'll find her. I, I don't even know why I keep hoping. Because hope is part of the human nature. It is one of the frailest things, yet it is almost impossible to completely kill. It does not embarrass itself with rationality, and neither does the hand of luck. She's probably still alive somewhere, waiting for you. Naruto smiled gratefully, his spirits at least a little bit lifted. Fu smiled back, speaking softly. Hey, you know what? I'll write directly to my girl, she'll help. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Fu unsealed a pen and a scroll, and quickly wrote down her letter before summoning a little dragon, small enough to coil around her arm. The little reptile, seeing her, immediately began speaking joyfully. Fu chan wad you want? Wad you want? I can help. Do you have candies? Where are we? Who's he? It's nice. Are there candies? Where? Hey now, calm down Kakeru-kun, you're being rude. Playfully scolded Fu. The little dragon seemed sheepish. Eh, sorry, Fu chan so, who's the guy? The friend, he's like me. Ooh, really? Say mister. Say mister. Which one do you have? Is it the ox squid thingy? No, I know. It's the psycho raccoon. No, the stuck up ape. There, none of them. I'm stuck with the fox. The fox? But he's the meanest. The Karukun. I called you for a reason you know. Oh, sorry Fu chan So what can I do? What can I do? Alright, give this to Haim, will ya? Yes sir. As it closed its paw on the parchment, the little dragon flew away in a flash, disappearing from sight at an incredible speed. Eh, uh, funny little guy. He reminds me of one of the toads I used to summon. I miss them. Hey, no need to be gloomy, maybe I can help. Why can't you use ninjutsu anymore? A seal. Yeah. 
One that was imprinted in my own blood. Harsh. But I already broke one. Naruto's eyes widened as he looked at the mint-haired woman, not sure if he should believe what she said, but unable to contain his hopes. You did. Yeah, but it's pretty painful, and you might need some time before you can actually use ninjutsu again. Breathing deeply, Naruto considered his options, thinking things over. He came to a conclusion fairly quickly. I appreciate what you offer me but I'll refuse. I think part of why I am so respected is because I can't use chakra anymore. If I must sacrifice my comfort for even one unborn child's sake, I will do it gladly. Few remained silent for a few moments before a sad smile came to her lips. You truly are an amazing man. To sacrifice yourself for strangers after all you've been through you more than anyone else have every right to be selfish, yet you are not. I don't understand and probably never will. I can only admire your determination and selflessness. The two spent the rest of the afternoon talking, getting to know each other a bit more. The more they talked, the more they felt a strange sense of belonging. When the sun began to set, they watched it in silence. Miles away, in a barely lit office, a woman was reading the message of her beloved, smiling fondly, then frowning lightly before her expression settled on longing with a sliver of sadness. Sighing to herself, she began to read the letter again. Hey, I'm Chan. Hot blondie located, he's in wave. Not exactly the knucklehead you told me about, he morphed into some kind of epic wise guy with people from all around coming for advice. I spent some time talking to him. He had it harsh, he's blaming himself for your disappearance and the Ichiraku problem. By the way, doggy boy lost any bit of brain if he even had any to begin with. He was blaming everything on Naruto and called me a demon whore. Naruto saved his ass, he said he doesn't want blood on this island. Mutt might be forgivable though, he looked like he was repentant last time I saw him, which was not too long before I wrote you. You might also want to know that your family is looking for you. They say it's to take the seals off. I don't know if we should believe them, you'll have to judge yourself, you've always been better at reading people. Going back to Naruto, he's depressed. I'm doing my best to cheer him up, but he's still down. Come here as soon as you can, I'm gonna need you on this one. You know, it's strange, I barely met him, yet I feel like I know him so well, and I already feel like I belong with him, just like with you. I think you'll fall in love with him all over again when you come, he's really sweet and such a gentleman. He's the kind of man that can help me with it. I can't wait to see you again my love. I'm waiting to embrace you again. Phew. Putting the letter down, Hinata looked at her work, quickly calculating how much time it would take her, and coming to the conclusion that she would be done in five days at the most. Calling in her personal bodyguards, she looked at the two. The couple worked perfectly together and never let her down. Smiling at her longtime friends, she spoke softly. We will go to Wave in four or five days to meet an old friend. They both smiled, knowing fully who she was talking about. Very well, we will prepare. Three days came and left. Each moment spent outside of the negotiations, the two young Jinchuriki were together, growing always closer. Naruto kept berating himself, he felt like he was letting Hinata down, but he couldn't stop himself from falling in love. Thankfully, the Kanoha delegation gave him some room, so they weren't there to add their accusations to his own. Accusations that were plaguing his mind as he looked in Fu's beautiful orange eyes, slowly gliding forward. When their lips touched, he felt a torrent of sensations course through his body. Kissing her, he felt like jolts of electricity coursed through his nerves, sending shivers of pleasure down his spine. His mind was in turmoil as contradicting feelings washed over him. Love, elation, relief, but also guilt, anger, and pain. He couldn't get out of his mind the fact that Fu was married to the Empress and that Hinata counted on him. He felt guilt and shame thinking of them, but no matter how much he tried, he couldn't pull away from the soft and enticing lips of the mint-haired woman. His battered heart had found a healing spring and would never let go. He felt Fuu's hand snaking on his shoulders, the right went to rest on his back, while the left dived in his blonde locks. His right hands went to cup her cheek while his left arm wrapped around her waist, pulling her closer to him. Slowly, they lowered themselves to the sand beneath them, only breaking their kiss to breathe and locking their lips together as soon as it was done. There, lying on the beach, they continued to kiss for several minutes. When they finally pulled away and paid a little more attention to their surroundings, they realized that Naruto was on top of her, lying in between her parted legs, pinning her down on the sand. Staring breathlessly in each other's eyes, they blushed when they realized the position they were in, but neither tried to pull away, far from that. With a sly grin, Fu wrapped her legs around his midsection, pulling him even closer. With a grin of his own, Naruto captured her lips once again as more passion slipped into the kiss, making the mint-haired girl moan slightly. Desire surging, they both left their hands to wander the other's body, Naruto's following the womanly curves of the general's body, while Fu sent her hands to sneak inside the hermit's kimono to caress his chest. 
Far from staying idle, Naruto continued to train his body so, while he was pacifistic, he knew how to defend himself, the consequence being, his chest was enough to make all but the most faithful straight woman drill. Following the woman's lead, Naruto slipped a hand under Fuwa's shirt, the fact that she left her armor pieces in her hotel room, making it easier. Feeling his hand on her, skin, Fuwa shuddered in pleasure. Then, deciding to take the lead, she flipped them over, now standing above Naruto, straddling his waist. But the smile and a quick peck on the lips, Fuwa righted herself, leading the blonde's hands to her hips. Smiling coyly at him, she began undressing, quickly getting rid of her Hayori before slowly and sensually pulling her shirt over her head, all the while slowly moving her hips against Naruto's growing arousal, revealing her breast-binding and perfect body. Seating up, Naruto placed a hand on her rear, caressing it lovingly while his other hand went to her back, bringing her closer. Placing his head on her breasts, he began to kiss them lovingly through the bindings, reveling in her moans of appreciation as her hands caressed his golden locks, encouraging him further. Fu breathed the blonde's name, causing him to look up to her face. Seeing her nod gently, he smiled lovingly before his hands went to undo her bindings, leaving her chest bare to the world. Seeing her breasts before his eyes, Naruto couldn't contain him and began to kiss them, eliciting more moans out of the mint-haired girl, while his left hand fell back on the girl's backside, and his right went to the unattended mound. Marveling at the way her breast seemed to perfectly fit in his hand, he continued to kiss and lick, causing the blushing girl more pleasure as she left out more and more drawn-out moans of pleasure. Growing tired of being the only one exposed, Fu let her hand fall onto Naruto's shoulder, pushing his beige coat aside. The blonde, understanding the unspoken request, helped her remove the troublesome garment, keeping his mouth connected to the beautiful mounds in front of him. Not wasting time, Naruto quickly took the top half of his kimono off as well, leaving him bare-chested too. Seating more comfortably in his lap, Fuwu placed a hand under his chin, pulling him off her breasts and raising his face. Resting her arms on, his shoulder, crossed behind his neck, she pulled him closer and kissed him softly as their chests connected, sending shivers of pleasure down their spines. For the two lovers, the universe narrowed down to only the other. They didn't care for what happened beyond that beach, except for one being. Naruto still had the feeling of guilt coursing through his mind, though dulled by the desire and love he felt for Fu, while the mint-haired container was completely elated, thinking of how her beloved Hinata was right about the blonde. Naruto's hand slowly glided down her curves, caressing every inch of skin along the way, before stopping just above her pants. Pulling out of the kiss regretfully, Naruto looked up at his tan skin goddess, seeking her approval. With a smile and a soft nod, Fu answered the silent enquiry. Naruto then began to lay her on her side, kissing her while his hands began to slide her pants off her. As his hands slid down, he followed suit, putting Fu back on her back and kissing his way down her body until he could finally reach her ankles. There, he took her sandals off before completely pulling her pants off. Kissing his way back up her leg, he made a little stop to kiss tenderly, the darkened spot on her white panties, causing a sharp gasp to escape Fu's lips, before resuming his journey, stopping once again to give each breast a kiss, before finally reaching her lips and kissing his lover passionately. Lightly biting her lip, Fu left her hands travel down Naruto's chest before reaching his waist and beginning to pull his pants off. Quickly dealing with his sandals, she then threw the pants aside, leaving him in his boxers. Fu reached out, putting her hands behind Naruto's head, pulling him into a kiss as she slowly laid back down on Naruto's coat. For a few minutes, they continued to make out, enjoying the touch of the other's skin, gradually melting in the other's embrace. Naruto was slightly surprised when he felt Fu's hand slide down his back and into his boxers, before giving a squeeze to his backside. Pulling out of the kiss, he looked at her with a shocked face. Fu looked back, a mischievous smile on her face. MMM, firm. Heard the woman before giving another squeeze and bringing him into another kiss. In retaliation, Naruto slipped his hand in Fu's panties and gave a playful squeeze to her buttock, causing her to smirk in the kiss. Breaking the kiss, they looked at each other's eyes with love and desire. Naruto can take me. Fu's voice was sensual, so arousing it was almost painful. Naruto kissed her passionately on the lips, keeping the kiss for a few moments before, once again, going down her body, leaving a trail of kiss in his wake. Reaching Fu's hips, he grabbed the hem of her panties and, kissing his way down her legs yet again, pulled them off. As he crawled back up her toned legs, he was drawn to her core, kissing lovingly at the exposed treasure. When Fu felt his breath on her womanhood, she shivered and soon after gasped in pleasure as his lips made contact. He kissed and licked, causing shivers of pleasure to course through Fu's body. The mint-haired girl wrapped her legs around his head in an effort to pull him closer, while her hands rested on his head, encouraging him to continue. As moans and pants escaped her lips, she stared at the orange sky through half-closed lids without seeing it, too lost in the pleasure and bliss. 
Naruto wasn't as good as Hinata, but he was still very talented and few wanted to bask entirely in his love. She was so far lost in her pleasure that she didn't felt his hands crawling on her skin until they began to fondle her breasts. Soon, Fu reached her peak and, moaning her lover's name, fell limp on the coat, panting and smiling. Naruto climbed back to her mouth, kissing every inch of her body on the way before pressing his lips against hers. Positioning himself at her entrance, Naruto gazed into her eyes, seeking approval. With a nod and a smile, Fu gave it. When the blonde entered her, the mint-haired woman left out a long drawn-out moan as shivers ran down her arching back. Once Naruto had completely entered her, they took a break to catch their breath and kiss. Then, Naruto began to move, slowly at first, letting his lover accommodate him, but when Fu began to buck her hips, he knew it was his cue to accelerate, and that he did, still kissing his goddess. For what felt like an eternity, they moved their bodies as one, melting against each other, their tongues dancing together. Fu's hands were gripping Naruto's shoulders with what little remained of her strength, while Naruto was holding her hips, pulling her closer with each thrust. Their minds were only a whirlpool of desire and growing pleasure, and their breaths were short. Soon, they reached their peak, muffling their cries of pleasure and love in a kiss. Naruto managed to put them on their side before all his energy left him, and for a few minutes they laid there, basking in the afterglow, their glimmering bodies caressed by the last rays of the retreating sun. But their peace was short-lived as they heard sounds of footsteps. Fearing what could happen if they were discovered, they quickly gathered their clothes, putting them in the coat they used as their love bed barely minutes before, and, once all the garments were gathered, leapt into the trees. Hiding in the canopy, they looked down on the beach and saw two of Fu's bodyguards walking out of the woods, the man running after a brunette, both laughing carelessly in the settling night. The woman allowed herself to get caught, still laughing before kissing the man full on the lips, and it was quite evident they were eager to indulge in the same pleasure Fu and Naruto had a few moments ago. Looking at them, the mint-haired woman smiled. Aneo and Kenshin. I'm happy for them. We should leave them alone how about we go on at your place. Naruto grinned, all feeling of shame forgotten for now, and picked her up bridal style before making his way to his home, their clothes still held inside the folded coat. The mighty beast tore through the air at incredible speed, cleaving clouds in half as it flew through them, even the raging storm ahead of it seemed to cower in fear as the fearsome creature flew toward it. Ibiko, matriarch of the Ryu clan, the mighty dragons, hadn't left her beloved mountains in an eternity. She was the mightiest of her kind, 70 feet long, 6. 5 feet large, and possessing scales of a deep emerald green with hues of gold. Many legends spoke of her, yet none could convey her majesty. She was said to have been born to a volcano and the deepest abyss, to be an immortal incarnation of nature's fury, to be the messenger of wrathful gods, ready to descend upon mankind if it stooped too low. She often chuckled at such tales. Had she indeed been such messenger, then mankind would have been extinct for a long time, and even though she was probably one of the oldest living beings in existence, surpassed in longevity only by the mighty Biju, she wasn't immortal like them. She had been born in the Hebe clan as it rose to sentience, becoming intelligent enough to speak and think. While her brethren retained the predatory mindset of their savage ancestors, she, along with the one that would become her mate, was born with a more evolved mind and an instinctive comprehension of the ways of nature. Through deep meditation, they had attuned themselves to the energies of the world and evolved into new creatures, the very first dragons, marking forever the legends of the snake clan. That was a millennia ago, and many snakes tried to attain their status, but the predatory and power-hungry mindset of their kind kept them from becoming what they yearned to be, and very few had actually achieved their transition, and all had joined them in their peaceful den, hidden deep into the snowy mountains of the north. For many years, she had watched the vileness of some humans bring pain upon more peaceful beings, losing her mate to a power-hungry fool centuries ago, she had long lost any hope to see men come to peace. Yet, as her road came to an end, a glimmer of hope had appeared. A fragile, weak-looking Hinata glared her firstborn down. She had come to her, her words were sincere, her voice even, her eyes unyielding, her dream generous, her heart pure. She was willing to bring peace to this war-struck land, to make it her home, to save the lives of countless strangers, because it was the right thing to do. Hibiko had gazed into her eyes and soul, and she had seen the pain she had gone through, the will to spare others from it. She didn't need more. Her children had joined the fight, their roars enough to win entire battles, their might displayed only against the most crazed and powerful warlords. She could have called upon their might to win easy victories and take the land as hers by sword and bow in a year, but she had chosen to go the hard way, using her mind and tongue to bring entire countries to her side, fighting most of her battles herself along with her armies. The Biko and her five children had been there at her wedding, her maid had been allowed to sign the summoning contract, one created especially for Hinata and her line. She considered the young human her friend, so when her son mentioned her journey back west to find her long-lost love, she immediately decided she would be the one carrying her. 
All these thought drifted through her mind as the storm dissipated in her wake. She could feel the off-filled gazes of the humans working in their fields far below, her three passengers on her head, a focal point of natural energy far on her left, beyond the horizon, which she recognized as Mount Mayaboku, home of the Toad clan. They flew over the Earth country an hour ago and would soon reach Wave country. Gazing on the horizon, Hibiko's gaze settled on the little bustling point that was Konoha. They would soon fly over it. Anata-chan. Spoke the serpentine being in her calm feminine voice. Yes Hibiko-sama. Konoha is there. Any thoughts on your mind you would like to share? I do not wish to dwell on what was, my mind is turned toward the future. I no longer feel any attachment to this village, nor do I hate it. Very well. We will arrive in about another hour. Thank you Hibiko-sama. Do not thank me, little one. You gave me some hope for the future and an occasion to stretch my limbs. Even through the raging wind around them, she could still hear Hinata's soft giggle. Deciding to do her best to reunite her friend with her lost love, she took even more speed, letting out a mighty roar as she flew over Konoha, mentally enjoying the possible reactions of the people below. Asuma Saratobi was walking in the peaceful streets of Konoha, his three-year-old son in his arms and his wife at his side. It was a beautiful day, everything was calm, and the threat of war had all but disappeared, thanks to the work of the very one Konoha had scorned, one Naruto Uzumaki. While a philosopher would have talked for hours about whatever this irony could make him think of, Asuma wasn't a philosopher, he was a man that wanted to enjoy his day with his family, nothing more. Suddenly, all this peace was shattered by a roar from high above. Looking at the sky, everyone in the street, hell, in all of Konoha, could see a snake-like creature fly through the sky at tremendous speed. Around them cries of fear and anguish were heard, panic began to take hold as civilians hurried toward the shelters, and children cried. But the ninja population stayed still, warily looking at the passing dragon. Seeing their protectors stand unmoving somehow calmed the civilians, and the panic ceased. Comforting his son, Asuma looked worriedly at the now disappearing dragon. I, I think it was headed to wave. Okage-sama left for a diplomatic meeting there with an imperial envoy some time ago, didn't she? Yeah you think there might be a connection. Asuma the dragon is the emblem of the empress herself, and she's told to be able to summon them. You think oh boy, if this meeting goes awry, we're doomed. At least, you aren't doomed today since you watched your tongue. Asuma smiled nervously. He certainly didn't want to anger his wife by throwing profanities near their son. The good news being, he was getting quite proficient at keeping his tongue in check. With a sigh, they resumed their walk, but worry still lingered in the corner of their minds. Anata laughed softly atop Hibiko's head. She couldn't believe such ancient and powerful creature was still pulling these kinds of pranks. Looking at her two companions, she smiled. They were sound asleep, cuddled up to each other. They both wore a dark yellow armor on their torso with shoulder pads of the same color. Underneath it, they wore a long-sleeved black coat falling on their tights and back and black pants. Their outfit was completed by black sandals. One had black hair tied up in what one could call a pineapple tail, and the other had long flowing brown hair, their lower faces concealed by skin-tight cloth masks. They came to the west sometime after her, but they hadn't met again before a few years, and by that time, she already was a powerful and respected general. Since then, they hadn't left her side, always fighting for her, to help and protect her. Hinata felt she was blessed to have such friends. Bringing her eyes back on the horizon, she turned her mind to her two loves, happy she would soon see them both again. And if I know few, she'll probably have failed to stop herself from going too far, looks like I won't have first dibs on Naruto-kun. In wave, a couple stirred under the rays of the sun. Letting out a contented sigh, Fuu snuggled a bit more into Naruto. The hermit, absent-mindedly caressing her back, couldn't help but feel like there was someone missing, but he refused to voice these thoughts. Deciding to take his mind off of this, he thought about the treaty between the lands of fire and wind and the empire. They had negotiated everything and the treaty had been signed just the day before. All in all, yesterday had been a good day. And a very good night too. Naruto. Yeah. Thank you. Huh? I should be the one thanking you. No. Sigh in fact you're the first man I had willingly. Hearing this, Naruto fell silent, the meaning of Fu's statement hitting him full force. Once he had somewhat digested the information, he pulled her closer to him, into his loving embrace. This seemed to comfort Fu enough, as she began to talk. It was two years and a half ago the war was nearing its end, we just had a couple warlords left to go one day, me and my guard left to scout the zone, like we already did hundreds of times before, but this time, we got caught in an ambush sleeping gas we had no time to react. When I woke up, I was trapped in the warlord's dungeon they for hours. I was trapped in this hell for four days Haim had to come herself to save me. I lost six friends in that hell, and the remaining four have never been the same. Neither have I. Yu chan I I'm sorry. Why? For the first time, I can touch a man without thinking of those monsters. 
Yeah, I guess that's good, but what about the Empress? Fu looked in his eyes, uncertainty written on her face. Biting her lip for a moment, she came to a decision. Naruto kun I'm about to tell you something I shouldn't, I'm doing it out of love for you, but also for her. I don't want to see you beating yourself up when you shouldn't. No, let me finish. I know full well where Hinata Hayuga is I married her. Why you mean Hinata-chan is? Yes, she's the empress. And before you begin hating yourself for what we did last night, that was part of our plans for the future well, mostly. Haim-chan was supposed to have first dibs, but hey, hey we got a bit carried away. Said Fu with a sheepish grin. Wh what do you mean part of your plans for the future? Well Hinata's feelings for you never disappeared, and um I kinda crushed on the description of you she gave me. Answered Fu with a blush. Naruto stared at her bewildered. Are you telling me you two were planning on sharing me? Um yeah. Fu looked nervously at him, wondering if he would be mad or would look at her and Hinata like they were disgusting perverts. Naruto thought about it for a few moments, still having troubles wrapping her mind around the possibility. But how can you be sure Hinata will like me as I am now? I've changed so much. Naruto-kun, do you trust me? Naruto looked at her and, after barely a second to think, nodded. Then believe me when I say she's going to love you now even more than she did before. Oh okay. Silence settled in the room. Fu was a bit worried, Naruto still looked a bit troubled by this all, and she was worried that he might react by rejecting them, the only comforting note being Naruto's arm still wrapped around her. To her relief though, Naruto progressively relaxed and a small smile came to his lips. So I'm gonna get twice the love, huh? Fu instantly brightened at hearing this. Twice. Oh come on, we aren't greedy. She said with a cheesy grin before snuggling deeper into his arms and purring in his ear, we're gonna give you much more. A shiver went down his spine as Fu's hands began to caress his body again. Air Fu Chan WH what if someone from Kanoha comes in? They're gonna ask questions and I doubt any of us wants to answer. Fu thought about it for a few moments before sighing. Guess you're right. I'm gonna go to the hotel and get changed. You wait for me for breakfast. Okay. Anything you want. The pastries are quite good. Mm, no, nothing particular, I trust you. And you'd better take something filling, Haim could arrive any time now, and after what we did last night well, I guess you can imagine. Images filled Naruto's head as a trickle of blood fell from his nose. With a giggle, Fu got up and quickly got dressed. Leaving a peck on his lips, Fu went to the window. I'll be right back, you'd better behave love. And, with a wink, she was gone. Naruto stayed there for a few moments before sighing, smiling and making his way to the shower. I have the feeling that, by the end of this day, I'm gonna be very happy or very tired maybe both. Soon a day stared in awe and fear as the mighty beast glided toward the earth. At first, she had thought Orochimaru's twisted experiments had come back to haunt them in the form of a flying snake, but she soon understood it was one of the legendary dragons rumored to support the blind empress. Looking at her right, she saw Gara and the recently arrived Taki envoy. They were here for few, and with a high-ranking official of the empire round, maybe the empress herself, it was doubtful they would get what they wanted. The arrival of the majestic creature had caused such a ruckus that nearly every inhabitant of the island had come to see, Naruto of course being among them. Soon after, few had arrived and surprised everyone by her choice of dress. A dark green yukata that showed off her figure. As the emerald beast lowered itself to the ground, three figures were apparent on its head. Soon, the dragon had landed, her head still towering SOME 16 feet above the ground. The three passengers leaped to the ground, landing gracefully. There were two women and a man. The obvious leader, the woman in a night blue yukata, then turned to the towering beast and bowed humbly. Thank you for your help Hibiko-sama. The chuckle that escaped the now named dragon was surprisingly soft for a creature so big and powerful, her voice strangely akin to that of a grandmother. Do not fret little one, after all you've done for my old heart, it is only normal that I help you. Now, you should go on with your endeavors, your mate is nearly bouncing around the place. But the giggle, the veiled figure turned to the crowd just in time to intercept a flying and smiling few. Haim Chan. I missed you. With a chuckle, the empress hugged her wife back, enjoying the warmth she had missed for so long before murmuring in her ear. I missed you too, Fu Chan. Looking at the crowd, she saw a blonde man wearing a kimono and a cloak come forward, smiling calmly, even though her eyes could notice eagerness in his steps. She told him, huh? Looking at his face, Hinata couldn't help but be happy her veil was still in place, she could feel a blush like she hadn't had in years crawl up her face. Oh dear Kami, he became quite handsome. Her gaze fell on his lips, they were curved upward in a small knowing smile. Once before her, he bowed low, softly grabbing her hand and bringing it to his mouth, leaving a fleeting kiss on her fingers. Empress-sama, it is my pleasure to welcome you to Wave Country. I hope the facilities will be to your taste, even though we don't have the utmost luxury. At this, Hinata scoffed. 
Please Naruto-san, I fought four years in a war. As long as there is a bed, it will do. The former heiress marveled at the ease with which she answered him, never before had she been able to talk so freely to him, and she was going to enjoy this. With another dazzling smile, Naruto took a step back, but before he could talk, the male bodyguard of the Empress did, and his voice caused each and every one of the rookies nine to widen their eyes in shock. My lady, permission to act freely. Granted. In an instant, Naruto was tackled to the ground by the other guard. As she rose back, she quickly pulled her mask down, revealing one a Michiraku. Naruto. I missed you. Did you miss your big sis? I hope you did. We heard of those treaties you signed, it's awesome. Dad and I knew you'd be awesome. I hope you're gonna come and visit. Oh and. Aim Chan, take time to breath. The other guard stepped forward before crouching near the blonde, pulling his mask down, revealing the smiling face of Iruka Yamino. By now, Naruto was in tears, pulling them both in a bear hug. While the moving reunion was taking place, Fu had grabbed Hinata's arm and began to lead her to the different delegations and was already done with the group from Suna. And then for Konoha we have Big Booby Hokage-sama. These two blondes there are Yamanaka, they have a weird fetish, they like to go in people's minds, and then those two are Akamichi, they eat like no tomorrow it's crazy. Oh and the two lazy ass there are Nara, I swear they sleep 25 hours a day. The two wild chicks there are Inuzuka and the mutt there too, and the coated guys are Aburam, never take a bug zapper near them. Oh, and these three are. I know. Hyugas. Hinata failed to completely control her voice, and some coldness slipped into it. She stepped toward Hiashi, doing her best to stay calm and keep her voice even. Hiashi san, my consort told me in a letter of your inquiry, it will be discussed later. I do have information on Hinata, but I will say nothing here. Depending on the result of a later meeting, I shall decide if your clan is worthy or not to hear what happened of her. Before any answer could be uttered, she turned to the two daimyos, both patiently waiting their turns to be introduced to the powerful woman. I take it you are the daimyo of wind and fire. Yes we are, it is an honor to meet you. The honor is mine, I heard many praises on the way you lead fire country, and I personally followed your example on more than a few matters. Said Hanada, nodding her head to the fire daimyo, then turning to the leader of wind country. I have also heard of you, I heard you were able to pull your country's treasury together already, even though you have but a few years of reign, a most impressive feat. Though, if I am to believe the letters Fu Chan sent me, you would do well to change some of your counselors, lest your guests kill themselves out of boredom. Hinata couldn't help but giggle when she saw the wind daimyo blush, both at the praise and the embarrassment. Hinata then turned her head to the last group, and instantly her mood fell. Her voice instantly grew arctic cold. What, may I ask, is Ataki Envoy doing here? The man with dark green hair stepped forward. We came to retrieve my daughter. Her place is among her people and family in Taki. Fu's answer was to give him the finger, her face marked with anger. Screw you old man. If you think I'm going back to this hellhole, then you're even more of a fool than you were before I left. The man turned his gaze to Fuu, frowning. You will show me respect, I am your father. Oh really? When did you learn? Cause six years ago you sure as hell weren't. You want me to go back to Taki? Well bring my word to the fool that is your brother. If I ever set foot in Taki again, it will be to burn it to the ground. Silence had fallen on the crowd as all watched over the exchange. The eight Taki shinobi knew they were outnumbered and so outpowered it wasn't funny anymore. Their only hope was to use diplomacy to bring Fu back. Fu's father then pulled his biggest trick out of his sleeve. Listen Fu Chan I know your mother and I made many mistakes, but we want to atone. We realized how much we were wrong when your brother was born. Don't you want to meet your four-year-old brother? The boy born to strangers is a stranger too. I have no family ties to you or anyone in Taki. Get the hell out of here before I bijadama your ass into oblivion. There was such coldness in her voice, such hatred, only the biggest of fools wouldn't have understood. With a sigh, the man signaled the other Taki shinobi to leave. Thus so you know we truly are sorry. Do bad I don't give a shit. But the defeated look on his face, the man left, but Fu was still fuming. The nerves of the guy. He screws up my life for 13 fucking years, and he think he'll get me to go back to that freaking hellhole with just a lil sorry. Bastard. The hand on her shoulder caused her to look above her shoulder, meeting Hinata's eyes through the veil. Come. I wish to discuss some things with Naruto-san, and I want you to be there. After that, we'll relax, okay? Yeah. Sai you had breakfast. Are you really asking that to a woman that just got down from a dragon's head? Asked Hinata amusedly. Looking above her shoulder, she noticed Tabiko had reverse summoned herself to her mountains. But almost immediately, her face snapped toward Hanabi. I wouldn't do that, young girl. Many have lost their lives because they looked at my face uninvited. Immediately, Hanabi froze. After a few moments of nervousness, she managed to squeak out a reply. Air sorry. 
curiosity got the better of me. Oh? I do believe your clan to be known for your impassivity. Many things have changed. This is also why we want to have Hinatanichan back. Perhaps. Now Fu Chan, you were talking about breakfast. Yeah. Naruto-kun and I had decided to have breakfast together, hopefully there'll be enough for three. But the giggle, Hinata nodded, then slid her arm around Naruto's as Fu did the same on the other side. You don't mind me tagging along, do you Naruto-san? Not at all, it would be my pleasure. The three then set out for Naruto's house, not really paying attention to the group behind them. Kenkuro was the first to recover. Say, didn't she say she wanted to bang a container they knew about? You think that's Naruto? That would mean the Empress knows him. Still, he's getting two of the hottest girls in the world. Lucky bastard. In Shikamaru's mind, something clicked. Blue hair, knows Naruto could it be. Troublesome. The Nara heir slipped his hands in his pocket, thinking of a rational way of telling the others, and felt a small paper. Taking it out, he quickly read it, paling. Shikamaru, you're a genius, and I know it. You probably already deduced my identity, I want to keep it secret, and you're probably too lazy to take my goals into account, so here is an incentive. If you tell anyone, I will mount your balls on a wall. With love. Hinata. Acting without thinking, Shikamaru incinerated the paper, gaining the attention of everyone around. Deciding it was safer to talk first, he immediately opened his mouth. I won't tell you what was on it, my ability to make children is at stake, and I won't risk it for you. With that, he walked away nervously, leaving a very confused group. Kiba, finally snapping out of his stupor, asked the only question on his mind. Am I the only one not getting it? Shikaku considered what might have caused his son's reaction, and quickly concluded a similar paper might be in his pocket, so he walked away wordlessly, intent on finding a secure place to dispose of the evidence and avoid a very painful and humiliating mutilation. On his way, he passed a skulking Sasuke muttering why didn't she mention me? The Achiha are still important dot I hope. Back with the three, they walked silently for some time, Naruto enjoying thoroughly the feeling of being surrounded by two gorgeous women. Then, Hinata broke the silence. You told him, didn't you? The tone was casual, but few immediately tensed. Yeah I he was hurting so much I. It's okay. You're not mad. No. You also got him first. Sorry. Taking her veil off, Hinata turned to Fu with a mischievous smile. You do realize you'll have to work hard to earn my forgiveness, Riite. Fu relaxed, a smile coming to her lips. If it's just that. By the way Nerukun, what do we have for breakfast? Nerukun. Hey, I'm talking to you. Said Fu, shaking his arm slightly, snapping Naruto out of his staring. Huh? Oh, sorry, didn't quite catch that. You were staring at her, weren't you? Hey, it's not my fault she became so beautiful. Yeah, quite the eye candy, huh? Anyway, what's on the menu? Well, mostly pastries, tea and coffee. Suddenly, Hinata stopped dead in her track, causing the two others to look at her in surprise. Air er, Hinata-chan, you okay? My cinnamon sense is tingling. She then proceeded to drag Naruto and Fu at high speed toward where her instinct was leading her, which happened to be Naruto's house. Stopping before the closed door, Hinata turned to Naruto, a hungry look on her face. There are cinnamon buns in there. Whose house is it? Mine. At once, Hinata's arms were around his neck as she kissed him passionately. Cinnamon buns for breakfast. You're gonna get banged Naru-kun. Now, you'd better open up, when she's done kissing you, she's gonna want her buns. Hinata, as soon as she realized she was kissing Naruto, tried to pull away, but couldn't due to the man's arms keeping her in place as he deepened the kiss. Before soon, she surrendered and began kissing back too. When they finally pulled away, they smiled at each other, breathless but happy. But then, Fu decided to remind them of her presence. So, are we gonna take this breakfast or what? Both turned to her, blushing a bit. She stood there, her arms crossed above her chest, pouting, her childish expression causing Hinata to giggle. Consider this part of the payback for having him before me. Now, as much as I love kissing you Naru-kun, we should really go in and have this breakfast. With a nod of his head, Naruto opened the door, letting his two ladies in. Well, at least I got a kiss and a pet name from Hinata-chan. This day keeps getting better and better. That's it for today guys, I will stop here. Thanks for listening don't forget to check out original author of this story link in description. Please consider subscriber our channel be part of what if journey. Take care bye.